Good afternoon and welcome to this session on human rights due diligence in times of COVID-19. My name is Matthias Torns. I'm the Deputy Secretary General of the IOE, International Organization of Employers. I would like to welcome our panelists to this session. I would like to welcome particularly Heidi Hauteler. She is the Vice President of the European Parliament. She is a former Minister of Development from Finland, and she's also an entrepreneur. She has founded her own restaurant, which might be relevant for our discussion today. With us is also a panel which will address which will I address afterwards. This us is Chris Southworth, Secretary General of the ICC UK, Anita Ramazastri. She is a professor of law at uh, Washington University, but she is also a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. This us will be Lara Volta. Everyone knows her perhaps from her report. She is a rapporteur on supply chain legislation at the European Parliament. And finally, we have um, Suzanne Weiss. She is a senior vice president at GTI, Japan Tobacco International, and very much engaged on issues linked, particularly um, linked to um, child labor and forced labor. So before we start our discussion with the panelists, Heidi, I would like to turn to you and ask you whether you can give us a bit of context, the impact of COVID-19 on supply chain and responsible business conduct. Over to you, Heidi. Thank you very much. Um, great opportunity to be speaking uh, ahead of a panel of such outstanding personalities whom I know quite well from uh, our work on due diligence. Uh, so indeed, um, the COVID-19 crisis has um, exposed the vulnerabilities of our supply chains in, in a way which, can, which cannot be compared with anything before. And um, I believe that we've also seen that um, to protect ourselves, we need to be understanding um, how we can uh, get all the uh, that personal protective equipment and, and how we can uh, ensure um, um, vaccine production. And then, of course, there are questions of solidarity uh, worldwide because, indeed, uh, nobody is safe until everybody is safe in, on this planet. Mm -hmm. But um, um, this has also uh, to do with the uh, resilience of companies. And some studies, um, for instance, by OECD, show that um, the companies that are doing their due diligence of their supply chain are also more resilient. Why? Because they have explored their business environment in detail. So they know where the risks are. And just yesterday, um, the Commissioner for Financial Markets, uh, Merit McGuinness of the EU, said that uh, indeed um, during the COVID-19 crisis, uh, companies have felt very concretely that so-called non-financial risks can really uh, uh, affect their business operations in a remarkable way. So we need to be, be aware of those uh, non-financial or, would I say, sustainability risks on human rights, environment, governance. And um, we have seen um, tragic examples of um, how uh, dropping of consumption in, in affluent countries like in Europe has affected the most uh, vulnerable people in the world. We have seen that the um, that retailers uh, have um, cancelled orders uh, from uh, textile uh, factories from the poorest countries in the world, leaving the most vulnerable people, often women, uh, without job. So this is something that um, is not acceptable from the ethical point of view, and in the future we will have to see how we will prevent these kind of situations. Um, so I'd also like to say that uh, uh, what is clear is that um, companies are more and more aware and prepared to, to map the vulnerabilities. And here we come to the due diligence process. And I will uh, count on my colleague uh, Lara Walters to explain what her proposal, uh, which we helped her to draft together, um, means uh, if it will be uh, uh, taken on board by the European Commission. And um, uh, we will be seeing that um, uh, the best companies already now, they are preparing for the future. Or maybe it's already today reality for many responsible companies that they indeed, uh, they have understood that uh, if they want to um, satisfy not just their shareholders and owners, but also the broader society and, uh, and also uh, consumers, they need to, to be diligent in terms of human rights and environment. But um, uh, we also see that um, the best companies, actually um, the front runners, I would say, they suffer from uh, the irresponsible companies which still can reap the profits. 
And here I believe that transparency um, reporting uh, plays a very important role because you can only be accountable for something as a company if you map your vulnerabilities, if you do your due diligence and re you report them pro properly. I'd like also to say that um, uh, we have a little bit of a question on uh, how much companies should trust the, the social auditors? Because it would be a bit too easy to say that, yes, we have a third-party independent auditor who says everything is fine. I think in the future this will not be any more like that. Uh, it means that um, sustainability and due diligence must become a key part of the business strategy of companies, which affects uh, the behavior of, uh, of CEOs, also boards. And let me also add that... Um, the crisis that we are going through shows that uh, we need to be aware of future crises because this will not be the last one, I'm afraid. There will be more pandemics and we will see the, the drastic uh, impact on climate change, of climate change on, uh, on especially on the most vulnerable, but it doesn't spare anyone. So we have a good reason to invite the private sector to take their responsibility. And um, I think this is the, the only way that we can reach uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, our common uh, EU agenda and uh, UN agenda. So I, I leave it to that and I'm, I'm very interested to, to, to learn more from, from your panel. Maybe a couple of uh, issues to discuss with you first. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was really brilliant. Perhaps um, let's start with the issue about, you know, the impact of um, decreasing demand, consumer demand in Europe and the US leading to problems in producing countries like Bangladesh, like Pakistan, right? Where because orders are going down, people are suddenly on the street without any access to social protection. And that is a challenge, isn't it? Right? That there are millions of people who lost their job because of um, COVID-19 and they don't have any access to any kind of social protection. That's the reason why the crisis becomes this humanitarian catastrophe um, and not just an employment crisis as in, as in many other countries. So my question is really, how can we create partnerships to address these systemic issues? Because that are systemic issues which a company will not be doing alone, right? A company cannot uh, set up social protection systems in Bangladesh or Pakistan or India, right? It's mm. something where we all need to work together, particularly also policies, of course, politics, right? You have a huge um, part to play. So how can you see that? Uh, yes, indeed, I believe very much that um, uh, an actor like the EU or, or any um, uh, government that wants to, to be a part of a positive change in the world and, and can afford supporting others should see that it puts its whole of toolbox into use, which means that, uh, for instance, the EU and its member states, um, not, not excluding other countries, uh, should um, indeed... Um, see that um, they use their development cooperation uh, uh, means uh, to encourage and, and help uh, uh, poor co poorer countries to put in place this what they call now social protection floor. Because I think it's become uh, really, really uh, unambiguously clear that um, uh, a social protection floor, which means a minimum social standards for everyone, from the, including the most vulnerable, is, is a prerequisite for any society to flourish and for any economy to flourish. So indeed, and on partnerships, um, I'd like to maybe quote to you one, one example that I was involved in, in sort of um, uh, encouraging to be set up is, uh, is the EU multi-stakeholder uh, cocoa, cocoa platform. Because um, it, sometimes it was difficult for me to, to, to believe that uh, the biggest uh, chocolate uh, companies in the world were really vocally uh, calling for mandatory human rights and uh, environment due diligence for a very simple reason, because their customers kept asking, am I sure that I'm not promoting child labor or deforestation when I buy your chocolate? And these companies are now working together with uh, the producer governments, uh, in this case, uh, it's Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana and the European Commission, its trade uh, department, its development cooperation department, with the civil society and, and employees organizations uh, in uh, the producing countries and in the EU. And we hope that this initiative could show that um, it's important to put the whole toolbox into the use because you cannot expect companies to solve everything alone. That's why many companies now are also ex expressing a need for sort of putting in place some accompanying measures, not just the due diligence obligations. And I think this is something that we will be moving to discuss uh, in the very near future. 
No, that's very helpful. And indeed, from the IOE side, for instance, we engage with the ITC industry also, the trade unions and 100 brands from the garment industry, or the big ones, in addressing the concerns which you just have raised, right? Social protection system in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and many other countries in order you know, to jointly together uh, try to uh, improve the situation there. Of course, it's so difficult because even if money is available in Bangladesh, the EU has given 120 million to support garment workers on, on the ground. It's very difficult to even identify them, right? Because they've moved to the villages, they're not registered, and so on and so forth. So a huge task for us ahead of, um, ahead of us. Um, you spoke about due diligence, and I think it's true. It's part of the responsibility to respect. When companies engage in due diligence, right, they look for tools you know, to help them in their risk assessment. And uh, always a very helpful tool in many companies using it is the human rights report of the U.S. State Department, right? They have uh, human rights reports public available on every mm -hmm. country, which are very founded. And for companies, it's extremely helpful to identify based on the risk. The U.S. State Department, uh, no, sorry, the U.S. Labor Department, um, ILAB, they also have an um, internet page, right, to uh, identify forced and tried labor and products, which is very helpful for companies, you know, when they have a, one click and they see there's a risk of child labor in this product in this country. Um, is the EU planning something like that, is that, like supporting tools, very practical, where particularly also smaller companies can engage and make it easy for them in their due diligence? Uh, yes, the European Commission is producing quite a lot of uh, also publicly available information on the country situations, but I do believe that the uh, we will see a, a bigger need uh, to advise uh, companies on, uh, on uh, uh, let's say, environmental, social governance situation on, in the countries where they operate. Uh, and um, I do think that, um, that uh, for instance, now we see, we see the situation in Myanmar after the military coup, that um, uh, as all the democratic world is, is calling uh, the return for democracy and release of, of the leaders and uh, democratically elected people, other political prisoners, that we also uh, need to call for, for companies to, to do their due diligence and, and to, to refrain uh, cooperation, refrain from cooperation with the companies that are directly feeding into the cash flows of, of the military, which is also a business uh, empire. So uh, in this kind of situations, I believe that the European Commission and other international players have a lot to contribute. The UN is also producing lists of companies that operate in, uh, in uh, occupied territories like Palestine uh, and others. So uh, this is something that, that uh, can guide companies in their operations so that they are not uh, supporting uh, situations which are, again, for instance, against international law. Thank you so much. And that, is, of course, you just mentioned Myanmar, a big dilemma situation, because if you go too early out, right, the only one who will suffer are probably the workers um, affected. If you stay, of course, there's a big danger that you become complicit to the situation. And there are so many countries where we face these kind of challenges, right? More than 70 countries in the world criminalize homosexuality. And how do you want to have a company culture and where everyone can express its own identity if it is mm -hmm. forbidden by law? Right, More than 40 countries don't have ratified the core conventions. More than 100 countries don't allow women in certain occupations. More than 20 countries don't allow women to work if the husband don't give the, uh, the, its agreement to that. So there are so many challenges. So in this dilemma situation where you are in a complex situation, you know, and you don't want to go out because the local workforce, mm -hmm. local communities will be the ones who are suffering, but you don't want to com be complicit. Any guidance from, the, from your side? Well, I think this is a really important point to discuss because um, uh, some companies now say that if they will face uh, strict uh, due diligence obligations, they will just simply have to, to, to leave uh, the operations and, and move to another place. And um, this would not be good because, uh, of course, uh, we want uh, companies to, to imp improve the situation to their best capacity and what can be reasonably expected of them. Uh, and um, your example on uh, on criminalizing or not tolerating homosexuality or other minorities, I think, is a really uh, useful one because um, I, I do think that uh, there's uh, a lot that the company can do in their internal practices and, and culture in recruitment to avoid discrimination 
on any ground as far as uh, as possible. But of course, uh, if you um, operate in Saudi Arabia, <laughs> it will be very difficult to 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 fully guarantee that that women would have. Uh, uh, the freedom to to decide over their own lives outside the workplace, but at least you can you can promote a good uh, egalitarian uh, corporate culture. The same in India, even if there's still a problem of uh, of the casteless people, for instance, the Dalits, uh, a company should not tolerate any kind of uh, of uh, discrimination of of Dalits in their recruitment procedures and and organization. So I think there's a lot that the company can do. And the biggest and most influential companies certainly can talk to the government and say, look, this is not in line with the values of our customers and and stakeholders. Uh, So please, you need to do something about this to bring your situation to to the level of international uh, human rights law. No, thank you for that. In the philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz 300 years ago said, you know, we live in the best of all possible worlds. When we look at today, we would probably not agree and don't think that is the best of all possible worlds. But, you know, looking forward in the whole notion building back better, how would your best possible world would look like when it comes to responsible business conduct? Well, I think um, uh, the best possible world... Um, we don't have uh, time to waste because we see that uh, uh, also that we've sort of uh, uh, gone grossly uh, beyond the planetary boundaries and that we have, um, according to the best science, we have about 10 years to, to change the tr- uh, change to, to the sustainability track. So um, I think companies must be an essential part of this change. Uh, there's no there's no future for for companies there's no future for for humanity unless we do it all together this is not a new idea because how many years ago did uh, ban ki moon already no i think it was even his um, his predecessor in the un who say, who invited the companies to the global contact con, uh, compact so and now we are in a situation that we are uh, 10 years after uh, the united nations guiding uh, uh, principles on business and human rights um, and it's time to implement those principles. And I'm happy to see that the EU is really determined to do that. I think the final boost came from uh, the European Commission's commitment to what we call Green Deal and the just transition. So um, the companies really need to be playing their part. And we as, uh, as customers and, and policymakers can help them to do that and, and to play our role. So it's, it's a common enterprise for sure. Thank you so much for this interview. And now I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Over to the panel. Okay, then let's start with our wonderful panel. Chris, first I would like to turn to you. You are the Secretary General of ICC UK, which means you have a huge membership of companies. You get their insight. What are the challenges with regard to COVID and human rights? You yourself are actually very active at the international level in the G20, in the G7. So from your perspective, what are the huge human rights impact of the crisis, of the pandemic? Well, I think the um, it's worth just saying thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and, you know, I've had a, a long conversation actually with our ambassador on uh, covering human rights in Geneva. So I think, I, you know, what I'm saying today is really what we're saying globally. I think that's important. You know, you know, the COVID has just disrupted all walks of life. You know, the it's not a human rights issue. Human rights is not really necessarily um, uh, specifically affected by COVID. Just COVID has affected everything. And that will naturally have an implication around the sort of human rights agenda. But the root problem in a way with human rights is we're 10 years on from the UN guiding principles. You know, I think it's it's pretty clear that some of the guiding principles have had a, a, a stronger impact than others. Uh, it's clear that elements of the human rights framework is not working. And that's been made very clear by both governments and NGOs, civil society at large. Uh, And there's a lot of truth to some of that. And I think we have to acknowledge it from a business point of view. Really, what we're saying is this is all about impact. It's not about feeling good. It's not about just making recommendations and changes. What we've got to uh, do is find a a, a mechanism in which we can create an improved system or improvements on the system that we already have. And most importantly, consult business in the process of coming to those conclusions. If we don't, then we're not going to get the impacts that we want. Uh, and, and not forget that, you know, businesses are also 
you know, leading in this area. Certainly from the ICC, we feel very strongly that the businesses in terms of promoting best practice, we want to see human rights uh, uh, absolutely adhered to. And so it's not in our interest. We don't want to see abuses of human rights in any areas, but it is terrifically complex. That's absolutely clear. And COVID has certainly made it more complex. But let's get the right solutions. Let's do it with business and do it in a way that works for everyone, developing countries as well as developed and all uh, uh, areas of society as well. Thank you, Chris. And you referred actually to the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles. The UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights has a process to develop a roadmap for the better implementation of the UN Guiding Principles. And we're very happy to have with us Anita. Anita, you are not only a professor of law at the Washington University, but you're also a member of the UN Working Group. In fact, you have been the chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights last year in 1920 when COVID hit us all. So what have you seen in the last year when it came to the impact of COVID, you as a working group? Yes, well, what we've seen is I think what many of us have seen, which is that we've done a lot of engagement with everybody, business, governments, and of course, civil society and workers. But what was invisible possibly before can't be invisible anymore. These are the workers in our global supply chains, whether it's workers in factories that are making gloves and personal protective equipment, or whether it is uh, workers that are picking our, our food and putting it on our table or engaging in meat processing. These people have really risked their lives during the pandemic, that they have actually been much more impacted. So in terms of human rights, right, essential workers are essential. We didn't really see them before, and they are at greater risk. And what we've seen is we must take steps. I mean, this whole concept of human rights due diligence and the guiding principles is really about life or death now. And I think that underscores for everybody the value and the dignity which we owe to these individuals um, because they are, have been essential and have been willing to put their lives on the line. So for me, that's, I think, the critical message. And, you know, I, I say this as a catchphrase, but, you know, we talk about the disposable masks, people are not disposable. And so really, again, I'm heartened to hear Chris say that business wants to lead on this because mm. human rights due diligence, now we're going to hear um, about regulation that's coming from the EU, but outside of regulation, business under the guiding principles has a, a sort of responsibility to act anyway to prevent human rights abuses, and that is key. Thank you, Anita. And indeed, you mentioned human rights due diligence, which is a key aspect of the sub supply chain legislation, which you, Lara, envisioned for the EU. You have been a rapporteur of a very important report, which has been adopted by the parliament um, this week with a huge, huge, huge majority, this adoption. So a huge success. Congratulations to you for this. But before we go into this human rights due diligence legislation, perhaps, first of all, your assessment, what is the impact of COVID on human rights? And From your perspective also as the parliament, what have you heard from business, from trade unions, from churches, from civil society? Over to you. Hmm. Um, I think I can only um, agree with the with the previous speaker. So this is something that has affected all walks of life and I think all different areas of life um, and not only human rights, although I think that human rights questions have become much more, more prominent due to them. Um, and as Anita said also, this is something that again showed to us the value of the bin men picking up our garbage and the, the postman putting mail in our, in our letterbox and the people harvesting and processing our food and, and making protective equipment. Um, so those things, I think, I think it was a useful reminder for all of us um, that you know the world doesn't only go go around on the on the consultants and the uh, and the managers um in fact it's it's quite the contrary so i think that has been useful for us um i think um we've all read the stories in the newspaper of course about where the the brunt of this crisis has ended up and of course like in any crisis that has been more with the most vulnerable um, in society, both within our, our European countries and, and abroad. Um, and I think that that for us is is a wake-up call to make sure that in our world that is so very interconnected, um, that we try to make value chains more robust, but that we also look inwards and look at our own impact and our own uh, businesses, because those impacts that we're talking about here, they do not only occur uh, in faraway places. Um, if meat workers here are being made to work and being packed away um, you know, with 20 in a in a small space, um, you know, to, to be able to, to service our food, um, then that is a similar adverse impact we need to avoid. 
Thank you. And you directly address actually businesses. And I'm very happy to have a company with us here who has been very engaged actually on the topic, particularly when it comes to child labor in the supply chain. We have with us Susanna from GTI. Susanna, GTI, you have presence everywhere basically around the world. So you really get the information directly from everywhere in the world, what are the challenges you are facing and what are the challenges with regards to human rights. But before we start, I really have want to address the elephant here in the roof. You know, engaging on human rights as a tobacco company, is that any way seriously? Is that not a contradiction in itself? Uh, thank you. Thank you. For, um, good to start with a controversial question. Um, I, I mean, and, and good to be able to, to have an opportunity to talk about it. I mean, I think I would say, say three things. Um, I'm Tobacco and human rights, I, I don't believe, are, are incompatible. I mean, tobacco isn't a violation of fundamental human rights. Human rights and the and the right to health is not the same as the right to being healthy. Um, I, I would add that human rights apply to all. Um, they're universal. It's, it's really not possible to exclude a particular industry. And if you do exclude a particular industry, you indirectly exclude our supply chain and you mentioned the tobacco growers um just just now and if you exclude the if you just exclude jti's voice from the human rights debate indirectly you're excluding the voice of 72,000 directly contracted farmers in some of the poorest countries of the world um, we know that there are, I think the ILO says that there are 40 million people um, who are engaged in, in the growing and processing of tobacco. And by excluding us, you exclude their voices. Um, and, and, and the last thing I, I would say is that, you know, to, to solve the human rights issues, you know, some of the systemic, really difficult to solve issues such as child labour, all parties that are involved need to have a voice and need to have a seat at the table because no one party can solve the situation and, and the problems alone. And, uh, you know, would really um, appreciate the opportunities to, to, to share our, um, our workings, our best practice and our learnings to, and, and spend time on finding solutions, not arguing about whether or not we can take part in the debate. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in on the back of it, can I jump in on the back of it? I think Susanna's made some you really good in. points there. You know, I think we're all pretty horrified by what we see in terms of just what COVID has exposed. It's exposed inequalities mm -hmm. in a, and problems all over the all over the global system. Wherever you look, there are there are issues. There, there is only one way that we're going to come back better, if I can use that build back better phrase, and that's collective action. You know, businesses can't do it on it on their own. Certain mm -hmm. industries can't do it on their own. Civil society can't do it it's on its own, and governments can't do it on, on their own either. The only way we're going to do it, we have an amazing opportunity to have a look at the system as to what's not working and then work together. That's the most important point, to, to make it work better uh, and pinpoint and use our energy and resources to, to, to promote collaborative action. That really applies right across the board. And I think if there's one thing that COVID has done is it's really mobilized us all on what's really important. Uh, and, and now's the moment to come back and, and do it, not only find a better solution, but do it in a better way than we've done in the past. No, I fully agree with that. And indeed, there are such an openness for collaboration, partnership we haven't seen before. Now, suddenly, organizations mm -hmm. partner with each other, which actually never spoke before. But let me go back to you, Zalana, because the question is really, what do you see with regards on human rights impact um, with regards to COVID? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I would echo some of the comments that, that have already been very powerfully made and that, that, you know, we did see the pandemic increasing human rights issues. And it, it's unfortunate that just at the time we're seeing that, our ability to conduct you know, the important due diligence process to engage with our rights holders has obviously become immeasurably more complicated be, because of COVID. Um, I, I think... I, I would also comment on on the the sort of essential workers, frontline workers. I mean, at, at JTI, I think actually largely because we have a, embedded human rights thinking into the business, but we had a really people first 
um, approach, um, way and over and above business continuity. And we were very conscious that whilst we could very quickly and very early on in the process send our office workers home to work as safely as possible as they could from home, we had frontline workers, our factory workers, who when we weren't able to do the same. And so we were really, really proactive in implementing um, all the health and safety measures as as early and as comprehensively as we could. And I I think in in most countries, um, sort of over over provided in those terms to make it as safe as we possibly could for those essential frontline workers. And I think the other thing I would say is we're very conscious that whilst we weren't able to do our um, frontline human rights impact assessments in quite the same way, we, um, I hate the word pivot, but we pivoted more to digital. Um, We did um, carry on some of the work through um, uh, um, a question, online questionnaires, which I think will make our due diligence impact assessment work much more effective when we can get back on the ground. And the one thing which we were very um, pleased with is that in many of our farming growing communities, we managed to continue our visits with our um, agricultural leaf technicians. Um, again, with increased health and safety measures put in place to keep them as safe as possible. But we continued to making we continued to make observations about human rights issues in our growing communities, um, whether it's relation to, to child labour, um, labour practices generally, or health and safety. So. Thank you. And you made a nice bridge actually to the issue of human rights due diligence, which is in the focus of so many processes and developments around the world. Anita, the UN Working Group, let me go to you, has given advice and guidance to the European Parliament on the mandatory due diligence law, I believe. And I'm guessing that was also very much built on the experience you are hearing around the world when it comes to due diligence and the challenges actually companies face when um, they do due diligence in COVID times. Could you elaborate a bit, you know, what has been the lessons learned when it came to um, due diligence in COVID times and what did you actually advise the European Commission to do? Well, I think there are a couple of things, and Suzanne mentioned, I think, some of the models that we're seeing, that technology has helped to bridge the gap and help to, to engage in human rights due diligence. You can't inspect factories in the same way or, or farms when, you, when you're not able to go out and do that because of lockdowns. But technology allows you to do some of that. But we will emphasize and continue to emphasize that stakeholder engagement, which is one of the cornerstones of human rights due diligence, rights holder engagement, um, needs to be done when possible on the ground and in person and at the beginning, and it's really important. So I'd say one of the key lessons, and in addition to thinking about how you pivot with technology, is that those companies that have really invested in local partnerships, you know, Chris mentions collective action and partnerships that actually have local civil society partners on the ground or trade union relationships and others, that they were able to be more proactive and more effective with their human rights due diligence in a time of crisis. So I think that's one of our key takeaways, is that having those local facilitators Uh, who are trusted intermediaries and having established those because of human rights due diligence made certain companies able to pivot and to continue to protect human rights or respect human rights, I should say, where they are. So a message to um, the EU, and not so much to the parliament, but to the commission as we move forward, is that we feel that proper consultation needs to be built into whatever regulation comes out. That there, if, if there isn't a requirement for engagement in human rights due diligence with affected rights holders and communities, then it becomes a top-down uh, effort that will not be successful in terms of identifying those salient risks. So that's our key message, I think. Thank you. And indeed, Lara, you wrote your report, a report of the parliament on the supply chain legislation in COVID times, right? I mean, the, the whole context in the last year was COVID and it is still COVID. So looking on your way forward and the way you envision forward, you know, what do you see are the challenges in COVID times? And, you know, what do you think are lessons learned with regards to COVID times when it comes to due diligence? I don't think I can fill in what the lessons learned are for, for businesses because I am a policymaker and I, I talk to plenty of businesses, of course, in this process. And I talk to 
um, you know, the trade unions that work with the businesses, um, but, you know, to go and 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 say this is what, what we've learned from the business point of view is difficult. What I can say is what Anita said, um, the, the uh, very much a fundamental part of the report I wrote and the the, um, the legislation that we want to see is that local contact and is that contact close to um, the, the the sources or the, the 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 places where most problems occur and that contact is contact is with uh, civil society with NGOs with trade unions with workers in the factories with journalists um, if you know if applicable um, but is basically making sure that there's an ear on the ground um, you know at the at the places that um, in terms of the, the the risk to the business are, are are most salient, and so that contact there, of course, has been impacted by 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 COVID. Uh, so I'm glad to see that from businesses, there's also um, you know models maybe being used more of you know those those um, those local contacts that are that are being used or mm-hmm. um, you know sort of trusted local partners. Um, but of course, in in practice, this is a problem that. We don't have a, a ready answer to yet. You could say, well, look, we've all switched, you know, to digital. And so you can do your consultation like that, too. But when I read stories in the newspapers about factories doing, you know, a sort of cleanup, especially for the day when an, an inspection is is, is uh, set to take place um, or workers being put under pressure, um, you know, especially for the days when, um, you know, when when maybe bosses from from um, from suppliers are visiting, then I think well probably you know a digital solution is not really going to be um, a meaningful one. So so it's it's a challenge, but I think the main thing here is to make sure that at least in the body of the the legislation we're introducing, we've got that mandatory consultation with with local partners. Thank you so much. And Chris, ITT is in between the company reality and the engagement with the political sphere, right? That is your task as ITT to be a bridge between both worlds. What have been your messages to policymakers when it comes to due diligence, the challenges company face um, when it is in the COVID-19 context? Well, I think some of the points have already been made. I think consultation is absolutely crucial. You know, we can't do this without business. So there's got to be good quality consultation. And as with most things these days, I think that's multi-stakeholder consultation, not just business consultation. We've got to hear all voices at the table here to find the right solution to that collective action point. But importantly, you know, it's, they've got to be impact focused. So long term sustainable impacts. Let's not look at stuff because it sounds good. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and practical and actionable. So the, you know, what can businesses do from a very pragmatic, practical perspective? Or what can we do collectively from a practical perspective? Because it's very easy to come forward with mandatory uh, measures. But, you know, and, and from the European point of view, and I say European I'll count the UK in there for, for the same, not, nothing to do with the EU necessarily, but there is a, a sort of a mindset from Europe that where human rights is very embedded within the, 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 the way we look at the world and the way that we go about our, our, the way we do business. And that's not necessarily replicated in the same way in different parts of the world. They have different views and different perspectives. So that's important. There are also different capabilities in different parts of the world. What the Europe can do is not the same as what the rest of the world can do. Uh, and some parts of the world, there's just no capability or very limited capability in terms of enforcement, in terms of monitoring and measuring and so on and so forth. So we've got to find a global solution. I think that's really important. It's quite clear, it seems to me, that we, we need a mix of mandatory and non-mandatory measures. Consultation clearly needs to be a really central component of that. But most importantly, we need to be very practical in terms of you know making sure that we get the outcome that we're all after which is where we don't see a world where human rights uh, abuse is taking place. Um, and and on, when I talk about practical, I mean, these are linked to other conversations going around in terms of COVID. You know, we need proper travel systems in place. It is very difficult. Digital is a lots of, does lots of great things, but it isn't the solution to everything. And, and it is very difficult to properly monitor uh, the situation if you're not actually physically there. So, you know, we need to have these systems all interconnected, all working together all of us working together and, and probably a, a, a mixed regime. It's pretty clear that the non-mixed regime, a, a non-mandatory uh, regime overall has not worked as well as we'd all hoped. Thank you. And I directly would like to challenge you there, Chris, because you said we need a global solution. But what kind of solution you're looking like, right? Because my experience is that the challenges are very much local. 
right? There are local challenges which are linked to the fact that there are no social protection schemes. That's the reason why in the garment um, supply chain, for instance, so many people in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in India are on the street with any kind of income support, right? So that is the reason why COVID-19 turned out to be a humanitarian catastrophe because of lacking social protection. When you look at informality, you know, where the biggest uh, work uh, decent work deficits are, for me, it is much more a local issue than actually a global issue but perhaps you can explain well uh, yeah when i say global i mean local national regional and international you know you know you got to remember that international companies are working across multiple jurisdictions they may be in 180 countries uh so there's clearly a, a need for we don't want a patchwork of different uh compliance regimes the more complicated it is the harder it is to comply with it that we do know it's it's that classic rule is one set of rules is always easier to understand and comply mm -hmm. to than 200 different sets of rules. But there are, clearly is a local component to it. Some countries have other so different challenges, you know, to your point. Um, and, and clearly there's, there's extra responsibility on national governments to find solutions to those where it clearly is probably easier to do at national, a local level. All I'm saying is it needs to be aligned at global level so that companies can actually do this properly, consistently across the board Uh, uh, across the whole supply chain, which may be lots of different jurisdictions. And then we don't get this patchwork where it's working one area, not working the other, uh, and so on. So I'm just talking about coordination, really. Thank you so much for that. And Chris, before you already spoke about the importance of partnership, right? Working together, collective action. And collective action we need on the one hand, of course, to address root causes, root causes like informality, root causes like lacking in social protection, poverty, but also um, partnership we might need for human rights due diligence, right? How we can support each other, how we can support companies to do their due diligence. And let me turn to you, Susan, actually, you know, from the company perspective, looking mm -hmm. at partnership, what do you need? What kind of partnerships you need? What support you need from government, policymaker, from NGOs, from trade union, and also from business organization like ICC and IE? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think And I think it's sort of linked to the, the lessons from, from COVID, actually, is that we, when you have a massive global crisis, you need a global framework to, res to respond. Um, and for human rights, this framework is the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights. We know it stipulates um, a, a principles approach to, to cooperation between the United Nations and businesses. And we, it, it, I, think that, I think the pandemic has just underlined how important that cooperation is. It, it's not possible for any one organization or actor in the human rights space to come up with A, what the solution is by themselves. And certainly, they even if they come up with the right solution, there's not one organization that can solve the problems on the ground. Um, so certainly from a, a business perspective, we really value partnerships with third party um, NGOs. Um, we like to work closely with governments um, um, on the remedies um, that that we see are needed um, because the, the human rights issues that we're dealing with in our supply chain, in our industry, you know, these are systemic, difficult issues. There isn't one solution that one party can solve. So, so those partnerships that you talked about are hugely, hugely valuable, um, re really important to, to businesses. Thank you so much. Lara, you have heard a company headquartered in Brussels, in Berlin, in London, in Tokyo, will not be able to trigger sustainable change on its own in the countries, right? And they will be probably able to identify the risk within the supply chain, but then mm. part of due diligence, of course, is to follow up, right? To mitigate the risks and to um, remedy the problems. In your legislative approach, How do you focus on this kind of partnership to address actually the risks which are in global supply chain? And how do you bring in all the different actors to play the role? Um, so in terms of partnerships, I think what we what we have, have done is, is encourage that. So what we said is, look, 
if parties, if businesses feel that um, it's useful for them to make sectoral approaches to due diligence, if it's useful for them to make uh, joint grievance mechanisms, for instance, um, then that is great and then they should be encouraged to do that. Um, it should not, of course, mean that then the due diligence that they perform is less um, you know, is qualitatively less than what they would have otherwise done. Um, but absolutely, we've been very clear that we would encourage any sort of sector or, or joint um, approaches to this if it is helpful to, to businesses. Um, and in terms of bringing in others, I think, um, as I said before, what's what's important is that that contact with um, people on the ground, that contact with others in, in the supply chain, trade unions and so forth. Um, but I think that the beauty of, of the approach that we have taken here is that we've said, look, we want businesses to look at their entire supply chain. Um, and so we don't want them to only look at that first tier supplier. We don't want them to only look at, um, you know, one, one, one particular um, supplier just because it is the one that they exercise most control over. Um, but what we want them to do is to look at that entire value chain and then zoom in on, drill down on, you know, the most salient risks, the risks that they expect are most relevant or that are most severe. Um, and by doing that, of course, we hope that then um, the impact can be can be greatest um, and that, you know, that that cooperation that we're talking about can be most useful because that would then lead a company to have those extra discussions with particular suppliers or, you know, to go the extra mile because in a certain geographical area, um, you know, there's been reports of child labor. Um, so that's the approach that we've we've taken here. Um, and I think that the 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 main thing here, too, is to, to make sure that we strike the right balance between being prescriptive and telling companies what they need to do, but also giving them the discretion that they need, um, because they tend to be the ones, of course, that know their businesses best. That's very true, of course. Thank you so much. We can't have just a very narrow law which does not give room for creativity and innovation by companies. I fully support that. And Anita, you, as part of the UN Working Group, you have a huge overview about innovative solutions and approaches which are emerging. And my feeling is that due diligence is an area where we see a lot of development, actually, right? When you're thinking back 15 years, no one spoke about human rights due diligence. At the European CSR Forum in 2003, 2004, the, it is even not mentioned, human rights due diligence. There's a whole report, several hundred pages long, human rights due diligence is not mentioned. And now, 15 years later, <laughs> we have Lara Wissert who just drafted the law on it, right? So you see this dynamic development. So from the UN Working Group perspective, can you hint to some best practice, some best practice which could be easily replicated when it comes to partnership, due diligence, addressing root causes? Yes. So I think, again, in terms of, of what you're saying, Matthias, I want to actually pivot back to another point. When you mentioned who else needs to be at the table and you mentioned the sort of underlying systemic issues of the informal economy or poverty, that the other key partner, of course, are governments, both home and host governments and part of this. And so, again, I think the EU has been very active and a leader in this, which is through the External Action Service and others, which is providing guidance and support both at the local level, but also to businesses, both small and medium who may not be equipped necessarily to develop good practice on their own. So what I would say is that a key good practice is for government to be an active partner in this, and that's what's going to be required from advanced economies, OECD, G20, and others, is that they need to lead as well. So that would be, I think, my first message in terms of what else is key to this, uh, to addressing the issues that you raise. A second piece is that in terms of good practice, where sectoral approaches are helpful is not just for the leaders, right? We've heard about JTI and we've heard about, you know, large companies companies have really, uh, ch that are champions, have robust, robust frameworks in place and they were able to move on their own. But it is within industries where uh, leaders can help those small and medium-sized enterprises, be it their suppliers or their partners, to engage in good practice, that there is volume and economies of scale that can be developed. I think we've seen that and we've seen sort of common standards. And so I'd say we need sectoral approaches, not for the large companies, but for the ones that are that are smaller and that are integral to these chains. So that that is a piece that we support. And then I think a, a last piece is there's cross sectoral approaches. So I think we need to also see that when it comes to even though you might have different businesses, they're often sourcing from the same places to make different things. You know, food um, and beverage. Uh, it, it, uh, 
ends up being in, in different places, but you need inspection of sometimes the same factories for packaging, for example. So I would just say that um, encouraging large companies that have the same suppliers to work together on training, capacity building, and really uh, what human rights due diligence looks like and trying to come up with frameworks that are common so that, again, expectations down the chain can be met are going to be key. Thank you for that. Chris, you already mentioned, you know, building back better. And this has become a slogan everyone is using now. My feeling is it's originated actually with the ILO Director General Guy Ryder, who said the new normal must be a better normal. So going back to this original phrase from Guy, the new normal must be a better normal. How should you, for you, the new normal look like? Very shortly, so we are able, to, all of us, to give a short um, snapshot how the new normal should look like. Over to you. Well, I, I think we've said um, a lot of it today. I mean, I think there are there are quite straightforward things that we can do, and we can draw from other areas as well. There's some good practice in the anti-corruption space with national contact points. There's good practice from uh, trade facilitation with national trade facilitation committees, where collaborative, multi-stakeholder forums are all working together. But you know, ultimately, it's about collaboration. It's about cooperation. It's about collective action. That's the way that we build back better and being very pragmatic and practical. But when we work together, we know from experience elsewhere uh, to the points that have all been made today, it works. It really does work. And you can do that from international level with local level, regional level uh, and very local community level. It can work. And we, we've simply got to get a better system into place and we will stand a much better chance of that uh, if we work together. Thank you so much. So then, over to you, the new normal, how should it look like? That's a big question, isn't it? Um, I'm, I, I think I would start and just reflect on some of the comments that other speakers have said about the, you know, we've, we've got a much greater awareness, I think, and focus of human rights issues um, as a result of COVID in the same way as we have in terms of the environment. Um, and I would really hope in doing that building back better that um, all companies have you know will use that greater awareness to act proactively to do the right thing which you know we think we're, we're doing in this space and to not wait for the legislative frameworks um but but to take to take steps proactively having said that broadly we support the proposals for the the um, mandatory due diligence um framework that we we've, we've talked about that Laura Laura's just talked about um because we see this as an opportunity to to raise standards across industry and to to get other companies also um undertaking you know pro proactive human rights um, impact assessments due diligence programs and perhaps more crucially following up with remedial actions and and taking steps to actually imp improve the underlying human rights of rights holders thank you thank you so much and so then you already referred to the mandatory due diligence law lara you already laid out what you want to have the new normal with your draft legislation. But beyond this draft legislation, what is your vision? What should be the new normal? Hmm. I suppose that this new due diligence legislation is, is part of a wider effort um, in, in the EU. Um, and that effort is focused on more sustainable corporate governance. Um, and I think that that is what we're, we're after in, in the end. I mean, we're after... Um, you know, fewer um, fewer instances of harm, I, environmental and, and, and in terms of human rights. But I think we're also after more sustainable corporate governance that can contribute to things like the Green Deal um, and and fewer CO2 emissions in Europe. And I think that that is, you know, that 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 vision or that question is is easier to talk about than to get done because I think that there, what's underlying is also the um, the primacy, or at least the, the 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 control and the pressure from shareholders and from investors, and so um, I think it's it's easy to say, well, companies should become more sustainable and they should do all of these things. But how do you do that if you know there's pressure from investors and shareholders that is very difficult to um, you know to to counter? So in my new normal, um, there would be a countering of that, and the business strategy of a company would match um, their due diligence efforts, and uh, a CEO and board members would be aware not only of financial or legal risks in a company, but also environmental uh, and human rights risks. And they would know their value chains 
better, exercising more control, and I think ultimately also um, making their companies more robust and avoiding reputational um, and financial harm uh, through those human rights uh, due diligence processes. Thank you so much. That was a really visionary. Now, Anita, you probably drafting at the moment your new normal with the roadmap for the better uptake of the UNGPs, and you will present that on the 16th of June to the Human Rights Council. So perhaps you can give us already a snapshot what we can expect on the 16th of June, what the new normal should look like with regards to the roadmap and perhaps also beyond. Yeah, I think three just quick points. The first one is this new normal of sustainable corporate governance and sustainable business needs to have human rights at the center and the heart of that. What we've seen is bifurcation of policy. We want policy coherence or responsible business conduct or the SDGs. Politicians, business, civil society will refer to the respect for human rights as a cornerstone always. I don't think we've crossed that bridge yet. A second piece that we haven't done is, again, looking at the role of other parties, gatekeepers that have leverage in terms of this ecosystem. So, of course, investors is, are a key part of this and financiers. So really looking at others who provide services and advice, the legal profession, consultants and others, they need to be brought to the table as well and respect human rights and advise their clients. And the third piece, which is the one that we've touched upon, actually perhaps the most briefly, is access to remedy, that hopefully human rights due diligence will lead to prevention of harm. But where it does not, we develop and devise really effective remediation. And this is our still our biggest mm -hmm. challenge. If we think of forced labor in particular, or child labor, as Suzanne mentioned, it still exists and is still a very an unfortunate phenomena. If we cannot provide remedy in those kinds of situations, then then all of our efforts will continue to fail. So thank you so much, Matthias, for the chance to, to engage in this dialogue. No, thank you to all of you, to all four of you. This has been a fascinating dialogue. I think there's a huge commitment to come better out of the crisis, to build mm -hmm. back better. I really hope that we can continue this conversation and more importantly, that we can follow up, that we can walk the talk. So thank you so much and stay safe.